So we're starting off today talking about skeletal cartilages. It's important to note that skeletal cartilages do not contain blood vessels or nerves. Um, they are going to be, not, be made up of dense connective tissue of perichondrium. All right, that is going to have blood vessels. And the reason why that's going to have blood vessels is it's going to almost be like with the skin where the basal layer of the dermis has, is right next to the blood supply so those cells can move out and die. But with this stuff, the way it's, it's it's going to be very, very similar to that to get its nutrients. All right, next one. So with our different skeletal cartilages, we'll find three types. We'll find hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibro cartilage. Hyaline cartilage will be good for support. So like one of the places where we're going to be finding hyaline cartilage is going to be in your bronchial tree. So it'll give a nice network of tubes for air to path, pass through that have a nice solid structure. Another place where we're going to be finding those is going to be lining our joint surfaces. Elastic cartilage is going to be similar, but it's going to have some elastic fibers in it, so it will have more of a tendency to be able to stretch and recoil. And lastly, we're going to have our fibrocartilages. These are going to be best for shock absorption and tensile strength. So these will be good to hold two bones together that you would be likely of having, um, you'd be likely having like a long axis for somebody trying to rip your arm off or something. You have a nice strong fibrocartilage ligament structure there, joint capsule to hold it together. So some places we're going to find these. First off, here's the blue that is going to be hyaline cartilage. So the example that I like to use and I used before was our bronchial tree. Another spot where you'll find it is going to be the costal cartilages. So this will be the thing that's going to connect your ribs to your sternum. And your nose is the last one. A good example of elastic cartilage is your ear. So you can see how your ear has similar qualities as, for example, your nose but the ear is just a little bit more flexible and it has a little bit more give to it than the nose would because it will be elastic cartilage in nature. And then our last one here, fibrocartilage. The things I think of most when I find fibrocartilage are the pubic symphysis and the inner vertebral discs. The inner vertebral discs are shock absorbers that you find between your vertebra and your spine. Okay. Next thing we want to talk to on this picture just for a moment is going to be axial versus appendicular skeleton. Your axial skeleton will include your skull or your head, your spine, and your rib cage or your thorax. The appendicular or your appendages will include your shoulder girdle, which is your clavicle and scapula, and your upper extremities, your arms, and your lower extremities, so your legs, and the pelvic girdle. So the pelvic girdle will be the attachment of the lower extremities to your appendix, to your uh, axial skeleton, and your and your shoulder girdle will be the attachment of your upper extremity or your arm to the axial skeleton. Okay, so with our cartilage, it can grow in two ways. It can grow through appositional growth, or it can grow through interstitial growth. Appositional growth will be more thickening of the cartilage, and appositional, sorry, and interstitial growth will be more of lengthening of your cartilage. Calcification, the way that is going to work is one of two things. It can A, be there when you're growing your bones because what happens is you first get a hyaline cartilage structure and it kind of gives you like an outline, like a dotted line for where you want bone to grow. Or it can happen with older age and that's going to be when your actual joint surfaces start to break down and the cartilage starts to get replaced with bone. We know of that as arthritis. Okay, next one. We have some different types of bone we want to talk about. We have long bones, short bones, flat bones and a regular bone. So long bones, when you think of a normal, when usually when most people think of a bone, they're thinking of long bones. So that would be like the bones you'd find in your arms or in your legs, the, the big long bones that attach one thing to the other. They have more length than they do width. With short bones, these will be small bones that are kind of like, the, like the, my favorite one that I think of is a cuboid in your foot. It is shaped like a cube. It is like a similar shape to an ice cube. Um, these ones, another example of where you would find a short bone would be something like your patella, all right? So 
short bones are going to be short and like they'll have a squat but regular structure to them. Flat bones, these are going to be thin and they can be curved but they don't have to be. So when I think of flat bones, the first thing that comes to mind is the sternum, which we have here, and the skull. So the skull is going to be made up of lots of flat bones. And the last one is going to be our irregular shaped bones. So look at this guy right here. This is a vertebra from your spine. Look how funky looking that is. It has really no rhyme or reason to it. It has some spongy bone, it has some short bone qualities, and it has some flat bone qualities back here. So it's kind of a mixture of many things. So we call that an irregular shaped bone. So what are our functions for bones? We've spoken about this already um, in our previous lectures with tissues. So they are going to be there for support protection, movement, storage, blood cell formation, and energy storage. So let's look at support. Kind of makes sense. You have your rib cage, right? And it's there to protect your lungs and to protect your heart, two of your most important organs, okay? The two sets of your most important organs. Next one's your brain. We have a nice thick skull to protect it. If you poke it, if you poke at somebody's head, I'm poking at my head right now, I'm not hurting my brain because I have a nice thick skull. Yes, I'm thick-headed. <laughs> but um, anyways, so yeah, so you have bone there to protect stuff, the soft organs that could be hurt by, that could be hurt e easily. So once again, protection. So it'll protect our spinal cord and all of our vital organs. With movement, it is the, the bones themselves aren't going to move alone, but they will act as levers to help our muscles move us. When I think of a lever, I think of if who, who, which of anybody that I will speak to here is going to be able to lift up a car on your own. Very unlikely. But you grab a jack, a car jack, and you have a big lever on it and you start twisting it, all of a sudden you can lift that car up pretty darn easily. Our next step is going to be minerals. Everybody thinks of bones and strong bones and they think of calcium. Drink your milk, calcium. So, But they are a big calcium store. And another thing they, they can store extra for us is our phosphorus right here. And then the next one is going to be blood cell formation. So we will have hematopoiesis, which is the making of blood cells occurring in our red bone marrow. And then the last one is in our bone marrow cavities, we're going to have triglyceride storage. So if you see in long bones, there's going to be yellow marrow. That is actually fatty tissue, and it is going to be storage of fat, and it will be triglyceride. So it will be an energy store for your body. Okay. So with our bones, they have some things on them called markings. You are going to have to learn a lot of bone markings in the coming weeks. The purpose for these markings is they are going to be there for, for sites to attach muscles to bones or one bone to another bone. So if we're using ligaments, that will be connecting bone to bone. If we're attaching muscle to bone, you're going to have a tendon. And then they're also going to be there to make our joint surfaces so we can have a nice smooth area so when one bone meets another bone they can slide freely up against one another or they can be glued tightly to one another. And then another thing we're going to be having some holes that we find in the bones. They'll find lots of holes in the bones when you get into the skull and the reason for is you want to be able to let blood vessels and nerves pass through without getting damaged. Okay, so markings. Let's look at these here. Let me get a little highlighter out. So with our markings, we're going to have a tuberosity. All right. The gist of what a tuberosity is going to be is it's going to be a, a rounded projection that could be rough. Okay. When I think of this, I think of your butt bone or your ischial tuberosity. You're going to have a crest which if you think of a crest, you think of like it's like a, it's going to be like a, you're getting like to the top of something and it'll have like a little bit of a ridge and it'll be sticking out quite a bit. So here's an example of a crest. This is called our iliac crest. A trochanter, okay, it's going to be a big bump when I think of a trochanter. And usually a lot of times when you see trochanters, you're going to see a greater and a lesser trochanter. So like here we have our greater trochanter and our lesser trochanter. A line is going to usually be, be found between two trochanters or two tuberosities. So the, the example that they use here is the intertrochanteric line. It's just going to be a line or it'll be something where there's like a narrow ridge and it comes up. Tubercle. 
a tubercle is going to be a small projection, okay, so it would almost be like a tiny trochanter. An example of the tuber tubercle could be this one right here, okay. An epicondyle, so an epi means above and condyle means a rounded surface. So this is an epicondyle is going to be a raised area above a condyle. So it's going to be something found above a round surface. So we get a condyle here. We get a condyle here. It's just going to be a raised area, like we said, above a round surface. A spine. A spine is going to be when you think of a spinous process on your vertebrae. That is the best thing to think of a spine. Or the be it's going to be like a flat wedge poking out from something. So you get your spinous process or your ischial spine out here. And then a prominence, okay, a prominence is, a process will be a prominence, it's just something that, once again, it's sticking out, okay, it, to tell a difference between a spine and a prominence, I mean, they're very similar to one another. Okay, we keep moving. So, we're going to have, we're going to have different parts that are going to help make our joints up. So, we'll have a head, okay usually when you get something with a head there's going to be a narrow neck that leads up to it so think about how your neck on most people not everybody is going to be narrow and then you get a large expansion for your head so the head will be the end of the bone that has a narrow neck going to it if you have a facet that is going to be a nice flat surface frequently found on a head but it'll be a nice flat surface that will be that will be good for two bones to meet, meet up so they say nearly flat articular surface. Articulation means the meeting of two bones. So that's where they come up with articular surface. Okay, condyle, we already said that's going to be a rounded process, a rounded articular process, so a rounded process that would help form a joint. And then we get a ramus. Ramus means arm. So when we get a ramus, it's going to be, a, they describe it in the book, like an arm-like bar. So it's just going to be attaching one thing to another. Okay, next one. We have a groove. So a groove is just what you think. A groove is going to be like a depression or a furrow. It is going to be a dugout area in a bone for something to follow. A fissure is going to be a narrow, awkwardly shapen hole, typically. Here's an example of a fissure. I'm pointing at it right here. Um, it'll be a narrow, awkwardly shapen hole. It looks like you like cut a little hole in a piece of paper. A foramen. Foramen are typically going to be nice and round or oval. They'll have a nice, pretty shape to them. A notch will be an indentation in the structure. Okay, so where's our where's the example that they used for a notch here? This is better for a notch on this top part here. That's a nice notch. All right. A meatus will be a long foramen. So the when I think of meatus, I think of your external auditory meatus, your ear. If you stick a Q-tip in your ear, it goes in there pretty deep. So that's going to be a canal long like long canal like passageway. A sinus, that's going to be a cavity that will have filled with air, and you will find those in the skull to help lighten the skull and make it so it's not so heavy for you to carry. And then last one will be a fossa. A fossa is going to be like a shallow, and it will be a larger depression in a bone. Quite a bit larger, more circular, flattened out than a furrow would be, because a furrow would seem like a little path. A fossa is usually going to be just like a big, big deep in uh, depression in a bone. Okay, with our bone, we're going to have some different ty types of textures. We can have compact bone, which is this. Let me get a pointer again. I got to do it on every side. This is compact bone, and this whole part in here, spongy bone. So compact bone is it is just what it sounds like. It's going to be sorry. It's going to be smushed, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be compacted. Spongy. It looks like a sponge. Now these are going to be around for two different reasons. Compact bone is going to be a dense protective outer layer that will be there to give you your structure and your support and your protection. Spongy bone, this stuff in here, is going to be there and that's where we're going to find our red bone marrow and inside the red bone marrow is where hematopoiesis occurs. So that's where we're going to have our red blood cell formation occurring. 
Okay, when we're looking at our red bones, we're going to have two parts to them. You have a diaphysis and you have an epiphysis. The diaphysis is going to be the long part, okay? If you think of like the body of the bone, that's the diaphysis. The epiphysis is going to be the expanded ends. So these guys would be the epiphysis. Your diaphysis is going to be made up mostly of compact bone and it will give you a nice supportive structure. Inside of that we find our yellow marrow, which we spoke a little bit about yellow marrow before as saying that that is going to be triglyceride storage or fat storage. It'll be a spot for your body to conserve energy. And then we get our red marrow here that will find those in the epiphysis. I ask you a lot, where do you find red bone marrow? In the epiphysis of the bone. What happens in the red bone marrow? It's going to make red blood cells, okay? Another thing with our epiphysis is that they're going to have two important things that are usually happening off of them. They're going to be attachment points for muscles and ligaments, and they are going to be they are going to make articular surfaces, so joint surfaces where two bones can come together and meet. All right, with our bones, they're going to have some different membranes. We have something called a periosteum, and we have something called an endosteum. So periosteum, I'm on the, going to the next slide for a second, it's going to be a fibrous outer coat to protect the outside of the bone. So if you went to break a bone, a lot of times it's not just going to have these sharp, sharp edges coming out of it because we have this periosteum here that is almost wrapping it up like saran wrap. It's going to help protect everything there. Endosteum is going to be very, very similar, but it's going to be found inside of the bone with spongy bone. All right, so endo is within, peri is around or outside of. So endosteum will be found inside the bone cavities. Periosteum will be found outside of the bone cavities. Um, within spongy bone, within flat bones, you have something called a diplo. I don't think I have a picture of it here, but with a diplo, what's going to happen is, let me draw you a little picture on here. You'll have a layer of bone. Okay, here's my one layer of bone, and then I get another layer of bone. The diplo will be this space in between them, where you see me kind of like clicking in here. The diplo would be the space in between them. And what the function of that space in between them is going to be, we'll find red bone marrow there. So we can have lots of red blood cell formation there. Okay. So with our red mo bone marrow in our adults, this is a picture of a fetus. I think you guys can all see that. And it shows all the red bone marrow throughout the baby. So the baby is trying to make lots and lots and lots of blood. Okay, anyways, so with our red bone marrow in adults, okay, they're going to be in the trabecular cavities. So that'll be in the epiphyses. So we'll find those in the epiphyses of our long bones, and you're going to find it in our flat bones. All right? With infants, there's going to be this medullary cavity. So let's go and show you the medullary cavity. This right here is the medullary cavity. That is where you'll find yellow bone marrow in adults. In infants, they have red bone marrow. Why? They're not working on fat storage in those bones yet. They're working on getting enough red blood cells to survive and grow rapidly. Okay, so medullary cavities are going to have spongy bone, and it's important, like we said, this is all spongy bone here. Why? So they can make red blood cells, and they can grow and have a greater, greater oxygen delivery system. So we're going to look at some microscopic anatomy now of the bone, specifically compact bone. When we're looking at them, they're going to have these things called a haversion system or an osteon. What that is, is that's going to be like the, a functional unit of the bone. The way it's described is it's going to be lamella surrounding a osteonic canal. So if right, I'm skipping ahead a couple slides, right here we're looking at right here we're looking at a microscopic view of bone and if you see we have these concentric circle these concentric circles are called lamella okay and they are going to be around a circle okay that circle is a hairversion canal another name for it is the central canal running through that central canal you're gonna have a blood vet you're gonna have a vein a nerve and an artery 
So you get your vein, nerve, and artery passing through each one of these. Okay, so we'll have, as you see this, this would be, if we come up here, this is like a whole bone. So we have a whole bunch of these central canals, maybe hundreds of them, inside a single layer, inside a single bone, if we were to cut it lengthwise and we were to look at it. And it's going to be important that we can connect these. So let's go back to where we were. So we had our lamella, and our lamella are going to be laid down in different ways. If you can see that, this is laid down in a crisscross type of action. The reason why this is going to be laid down in a crisscross type of action is so your body can resist um, tension or forces in multiple directions. It just can't get pushed up and down. It can get pushed up, down, left, right, and it can protect itself in all different ways. And once again, we said that we had the central canals, and another name for them were haversion canals. So another one we're going to talk about, I'll show you on the next one, is going to be perforating canals. Okay, what perforating canals do is, do you see how here's a central canal, here's a central canal, we have all these central canals here. And every once in a while, we'll have this thing right here called a perforating canal. Why is that there? Why is it important? It's important because it connects two central canals. Well, who cares? Why? The reason why is, let's say that something happens and I get a dam, I damage my bone I damage my bone right here. Let's say uh, I damage my bone right here. Okay. Well, we have a perforating canal, so I wouldn't be getting any more blood flow, let's say, going in this direction. Well, since we have a perforating canal, or a Volkmann's canal, that's going to connect two different blood supplies. So if you damage your bone here, we'll still have blood supply from here to protect the rest of that. And only this little area here will be damaged. Next one we're going to talk about are going to be our lacunae, all right? Our lacunae are going to be these little holes right here. What happens with lacunae is we have mature osteoblasts living inside of a lacunae. A lacunae is going to be like a little, I think of it as like a little home that your mature osteoblasts live in. Those are called osteocytes. So an osteocyte is a mature osteoblast. And I say that they're mature, they're old, and now they're retired. So they lacuna matata. So what are they doing? They're sitting here in this little hammock-shaped thing, living their life, doing the job that they were made for, and they're happy with it. They're just relaxing. They're, they're happy. Then another one we're going to come back here and speak about for a second are canaliculi. What canaliculi are, are there these little breaks, and you can see them a little bit better in here. There's these little cracks that are going to connect one lacuna to the next lacuna. Well, why? So the cells can talk to each other. So if your body needs calcium, then those cells know, okay, stop laying down calcium. Or if they have too much calcium in the blood, then these cells go, oh, maybe the cells I speak of are the osteocytes, but they go, oh, maybe I should start laying down calcium and pulling it from the blood. So it's very important. Now looking in further, Here's our microscopic anatomy of spongy bones. So this bone here on your left is normal, healthy spongy bone. This bone is osteoporotic bone. Can you see the difference between the two? So this is nice, thick. It has a good pattern to it, and this one's broken down and thinning. So this one probably has a good 70-80% loss of, of uh, spongy bone. That is not good, and the reason for it is that this is making your bone lose its tensile strength. Kind of like when um, highways and stuff are being laid down, they put that rebar, they put the metal rods in there, so it has a little bit of, it can force and flex and move in multiple directions. That's how this stuff is laid out here, so your bone can take, can take pressure from many different directions. Okay, with bone formation, or bone development, we're going to call that osteogenesis or bone ossification. It's going to happen um, It's going to happen in the second month of fetal development so when baby's being made it's going to start in the second month and your bones are going to continue to grow through early adulthood. Some people's bones keep growing until they're like in their mid-twenties so I, I think like me for example I was done growing when I was like 18 or 19 but some people they grow for quite a while. And the last one is going to be bone remodeling. So your bones are constantly changing their shape and the structure of, let's go back here, their trabeculae to meet your current demands. So if you're very, very active, you'll have a nice thick 
trabecular network because you're jumping up and down, you're doing all kinds of running and walking, and you're an active person. So you're, if you're, you're active, your body needs to respond by laying down a nice, good bone supply. If you're inactive, on the other hand, uh, people with osteoporosis typically have a diet low in calcium and inactivity. And what happens is, is that the body's not worried about laying down all this bone to keep you protected and have and have uh, have stressors from many different directions. So it doesn't do it. It doesn't care. So it just says, eh, we'll just break the bone down. We don't need to lay it down. I skipped a slide here. Let me go back for a moment. We went from here. Okay, we went from here. We said no osteons, and I skipped this slide. So with our bone cells, or osteogenic cells, there's going to be three types. There's going to be three types. Write this down. There's going to be osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Blasts build. Osteoblasts build bone. They lay down calcium and help with the formation of new bone. Clasts, class, collapse. So osteoclasts break down bone. Let's go one step further. If the calcium level in my blood is too high, I would want to increase osteoblastic or osteoblast activity. Why? It's going to lay down new bone and draw calcium out of my blood. If my calcium level in my blood is too too low, then I increase osteoclastic activity. I release calcium and the calcium level in my blood can increase. And as we already spoke about a little bit ago was osteocytes. Osteocytes are going to be mature osteocytes are going to be mature bone cells. Okay, next one, we have osteoid, or organic bone matrix. Okay, that's just going to be the stuff that the osteoblasts lay down. So when I said that the osteoblasts are building bone, this osteoid, organic bone matrix, is what's going to be laying them down. It's going to be made up of ground substance and collagen fibers. Okay, the collagen fibers are going to be the stuff that gives the bone its characteristic strength and flexibility. And then we have the, uh, these other things called hydroxyapatites. This makes up most of the bone mass. So when people think of strong bones, once again, we talk to calcium. So this is going to so this is going to be mainly most made up of calcium phosphate crystals and this is going to be what gives the bone its strong, once again, strong, rigid structures. Okay, we talked about our bone in the formation here already, but let's just go over it again. So we have osteogenesis, which is bone formation. It starts in the second month of fetal development, and you grow until your mid to late 20s. And your bones remodel as you age. So with your bones, the way they're going to be formed is going to be in two ways. You have intramembranous bone formation, and you have enchondral bone formation. Intramembranous bone formation, your bones are going to grow in a sheet-like manner. So imagine like your skull you lay down one sheet of paper, then you lay down another sheet of paper, then another sheet, then another sheet, and you have all these sheets of paper getting laid down, and over time this forms a very, very strong bony cavity. So that's going to be the way these intramembranous will grow. And chondral bone formation is going to be your, the way your bones lengthen, and this is going to be how we make our, our long bones. And where I was saying that we use hyaline cartilage to make like a dotted line or an outline for your bone formation, this is where that's going to happen and how it will occur. So, here's how we're going to make a long bone with our enchondral ossification. So we have some hyaline cartilage on the outside is a, is a dotted line for us to follow. Then we're going to get our primary bone color. Okay, so this lays down and we get some lengthening of the bone. So this is our primary ossification center. It is the first place where we started to lay down um, hard bone compact bone. Keeps growing, keeps growing, all right, keeps getting longer. When baby's born, we lay down these secondary ossification centers. What's going to happen with our secondary ossification centers are these are going to be where the bone is going to grow actually in length. Bone will grow in length. So we get our 
epiphysis or epif epif sorry epiphyseal plate that will be the plate of hyaline cartilage that you find between your primary and your secondary ossification centers so this is where we're going to have lots of active bone cells dividing and growing when you go to the doctor and the doctor can take an x-ray of you and see how tall you're going to be, the way they can figure that out is there's a calculation based on how big is the epiphyseal plate, how long is your primary ossification center, and what's your general stature at the moment with your age. So they can take all those together and say, oh, this person is going to be about yay big. Also important to notice, here's a baby at birth. This bone is all cartilaginous. It is not strong enough for the baby to get up and start walking. As you see here, this looks like a much stronger structure that's not made up of mostly cartilage. So babies can't walk right away. One of the reasons why is because their bones aren't ready for it. Their bones are made up of cartilage. Here this bone is starting to get ossified, it's hardening, and they are ready to stand up and it can actually support their body weight. Okay, so interstitial growth is going to help with lengthening our bones and appositional growth works with thickening the bones. Kind of the same thing with the cartilage, right? We had the interstitial cartilaginous growth or interstitial growth of cartilage. That stuff was going to thicken it and the appositional growth would make it longer. Throughout your life, like we were saying, is your bones are constantly going to be remodeled. But what's interesting is you can look at a kid and you can look at an adult and you can see that their bone structure changes. So as their bone structure is changing, in order to make it good and useful, the body's actually going to have to break some of the bone down and rebuild some of the bone. So it's always in this uh, state of repair or remodeling. So here's a growth phase, all right? So let's say your bone's normally like this, okay? You're at your full age. What happens when you get to full age? You're going to have bone remodeling. It's going to come down. Look at this dotted line here. It's going to come down. It's going to thicken up. And what it'll do is it will have a little bit wider joint surface and it'll make you better to prepare. So, if we're looking here, this is going to be the way our bone's going to be made. Okay, so we have this thing called a resting zone. We have a proliferation zone. We have hypertrophic zone, calcification zone, and, and our um, ossification zone. So here, these cells are just kind of relaxing. They're not doing much. Here, our cells are actively dividing. As the cells are actively dividing, they kind of start getting pushed out here, and they're going to enlarge. Okay, over time, they get pushed a little bit further. They start becoming calcified. And then up here, we have our new bone forming. Okay, so this stuff looks kind of like hyaline cartilage. So that's going to be where we have our epiphyseal plate. This stuff in here, we have the formation of our new bone. So that's going to be where we have our ossification, we have our, we have our, uh, we have our calcium deposits and all that stuff. Okay, so hormonal regulation with our bones. We have growth hormone, we have thyroid, and we have we have our gonadotropins, so that would be testosterone and estrogen. Growth hormone, you guys have heard of growth hormone a lot in, um, the, in professional sports, and that's going to help with muscle growth. But another thing it helps out with is bone growth. So everybody, like I think of baseball and I think of Sammy Sosa, how his head grew like three hat sizes or two hat size, something ridiculous it grew by. And the reason why is because he was taking growth hormone. His head got huge. It just kept growing because, it's yes, it's going to help your muscles grow, but at the same time, it's making your bones grow. Okay. Thyroid hormone, it's actually going to be our parathyroid hormone is going to help with our bone growth. And then we'll have our t testosterones and estrogens. So when you hit puberty, you usually have some sort of a grow. You, you'll get a growth spurt. All right, and as your testosterone and estrogen levels get normal and they're there for a while, they're going to help close those epiphyseal plates. So let's look back. Here's our epiphyseal plate, and that's where our bone's going to actually be growing. So as this closes and that narrows, that means that you're going to stop growing. Okay, bone deposits. 
these are going to happen when you get an injury. So when you break a bone, it lay, it like heals everything up and it lays down this big old callus. So when a bone is injured or it needs extra strength, you start to lay down deposits. It kind of makes sense, right? Because we're going to want to strengthen an uh, injured area. Bone removal. When we're remodeling bone, we're going to want to remove sections and then rebuild other sections. So the way the remodeling is going to work is we're going to have osteoclasts collapse or break down our bone, and then we'll have osteoblasts rebuild or remodel that bone. So we'll have some hormones that I want you guys to know about. We want to know about calcitonin, and we want to know about parathyroid hormone. Calcitonin increases osteoblastic activity. Parathyroid hormone increases osteoclastic activity. So calcitonin will decrease my calcium levels. Parathyroid will increase, sorry, this is like terrible handwriting here, my calcium levels. What do we need calcium for? You're going to learn a lot about calcium throughout this semester. You need calcium for for your nerves to work properly. You need mus calcium for your muscles to contract and relax. You're going to need calcium for your blood to clot properly. You're going to need calcium for all kinds of stuff. And if you don't have proper calcium supplies, none of that stuff will happen. That's why we have such a huge reserve of calcium in our bones. Okay, so like we were saying, blood calcium is going to be controlled by hormones. We said parathyroid hormone is going to be associated with osteoclastic activity. So if I have decrease in calcium levels in my blood, my parathyroid hormones, sorry, my parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone. Those tell my osteoclasts to activate and they start to break down bone and they release calcium levels until our blood levels increase. Okay, once the blood levels increase, we're happy. If they increase too high, then we're going to do the opposite. We would release calcitonin, which would increase osteoblastic activity, and then we would lay down calcium and drop our calcium levels. Okay, so if we have increased calcium, we get our thyroid releasing calcitonin, osteoblastic activity increases, we lay down the calcium salts, and we drop our blood levels. Okay, so there's this thing called Wolf's Law. We already talked about this a little bit. It's kind of like use it or lose it. If you have your, if you're using your bones, we said they remodel throughout your whole life. If you're doing certain types of activities, those bones will remodel to accommodate that type of activity. So they'll have greater strength in a different way. So, for example, let's say you walk down like that outsides of your feet and you kind of had a bow-legged type of walk. If you did that for years and years and years at end, sooner or later your body could theoretically lay down the bone and make your bones bow-legged for you over time. That'd take a long, long time, but it could happen. Another one could be handedness. If you're right-handed versus left-handed, your right hand is going to be stronger and more muscular, your right arm in general. So what's going to happen? Those bones will be slightly stronger and slightly thicker than the bones in your left arm. Why? The muscles are stronger, so it's more likely to get damaged. Okay, so we're in bone fractures. Oops. Sorry. So, we're in bone fractures. We're All right. They can be classified in different ways. It can be the position of the bone, if it broke the whole bone, how the bone was broken, like long axis or whatever, and then if the end plate was was uh, poking through the skin. So first off, is a bone displaced or non-displaced. So you could break your bone and it's still, let's draw some pictures. So you break your bone and it's still lined up nicely. That would be non-displaced. A fracture like that 
would be a displaced fracture, so it's not lined up. A complete break would be your bone is broken into pieces. An incomplete break would be like, um, here's my bone, okay, and it's like kind of broken, but not all the way through. So like part of it broke, but it's not broken all the way through. Linear, so my bone, bone broke like a part like this. So this is the break between these two red lines, or transverse, all right, it's perpendicular. So it's like how all these fractures are up here. And then compound. Compound means that you're bleeding. It means that the bone's poking through your skin. This is trouble. We need to take care of it right now. Simple means it's, it's, eh, it's like it can be less dangerous. Not always, though, but it's not penetrating the skin. So compound, it's out of the skin. Simple, it's in the skin. Okay, looking here, we have something called a comminuted fracture. That's going to be when your bone breaks into multiple pieces. Here we have a compression fracture. So compression fractures usually is going to be when you actually smush something. Think of smushing a hamburger bun or a, or a sandwich. That's going to be a compression fracture. Spiral fracture, it is basically what it sounds like. It looked like almost the bottom of an ice cream cone and it will spiral off. Epiphyseal fractures are very dangerous. Remember epiphyseal plate? That can be the weak spot of a bone. Why? It's not hardened. It's still cartilage. So if a little one breaks their bone, they, cut, they could have a slipped epiph epiphyseal plate. And that can be issues. Why? Because what if they're not done growing and one side is going to grow? So when this happens, you need to go to somebody trained well to deal with this situation. A depression. Think of getting hit in the head with a ball or something and you just get a depression in the spine, in the spine, in your skull. This does a good job of showing it. A green stick fracture. Um, a green stick fracture literally comes from if you were to take a piece of a, a piece of wood, like break off a branch from a tree, and it's a thin young piece of wood. You break it, and the inside of it's green, and it kind of like frays apart in little pieces, but it's not completely broken, or it doesn't completely come into two places. That's what happens with a green stick. This is usually going to happen with kids, and it's going to happen because that periosteum, the outermost layer of the bone, let's go all the way up to the top, the periosteum, oh, we went through a lot of stuff today, this outer layer of the bone isn't broken, but the stuff inside of it all shattered, but it's, this periosteum is kind of holding it tight and together. Okay, let's get to our fractures. Okay, so how do we heal a bone fracture? First off, you get a hematoma. So you're going to have a blood clot and you're going to have an area and a bruise. Okay? The area is going to become swelled and painful. Basically, we start a clot so you don't bleed to death. Next, we're going to lay down a cartilaginous callus. Why? Think about when the bone was growing. We had, the, we had this hyaline cartilage area that acted as an outline of where we wanted bone so we can lay, make cartilage a lot quicker than we can make bone. So what's the body do? It lays down cartilage is a temporary band-aid and now our next step is going to be to replace that cartilage with bone. So we call that a bony callus. And then over time we remodel and we get the bone to look pretty much the same. Do you notice this bump right here? So usually when you get a fracture you have extra bumps and grooves in the bone. And what that is there is the body's trying to make it a little bit thicker and a little bit stronger than, than the surrounding areas. Okay, so let's look at it. We form a blood clot. We lay down an outline of what we want it to look like. So we'll call that our, we'll call that our cartilaginous or fibrocartilaginous band-aid. Then we get a bony band-aid, and then we remodel it. And if you see, it's thickened here. And the reason why it's thickened is we want this to have an extra protective layer because that could be a weak spot in your bone if it didn't do it. Okay, next one. Most people are done growing by age 25. Some people grow longer, some people, uh, some people don't. Some people are done growing er earlier. Uh, with many people around your 
40, 50 years old, you're going to start to lose bone mass. Why? Because usually around 40, 50 years old, your hormones start to taper off. Your testosterone and estrogen start to taper off. As those taper off, those are bone protecting hormones. It's more important in women than in men. But as those taper off, their bones, their bones start to break down more. You start doing more osteoclastic activity versus osteoblastic activity. How fast your bones are going to break down? That's going to be pretty much genetics, but it also has to do with environmental stuff. For example, if you don't have a lot of calcium in your diet, you never lay down enough bone in the first place. All right? Or if you're eating foods with lots of estrogens in them or phytoestrogens, stuff to help you be precursors for estrogens, maybe that'll help you and keep more estrogen in your blood, females, and it will help protect your bones. And then in old, as you get older and older, then bone resorption starts to predominate. So when you hear of an older person fall, they're much more likely to break their arm than, like I have a four-year-old, if, if she falls, I mean, she, she's like a ball of rubber. She just can bounce off of stuff. She doesn't get hurt very easily. Well, she gets hurt, but she doesn't get her broken bones. Oops. Okay. So with osteoporosis, we call, it an, we call it a homeostatic imbalance. Here would be normal bone. Here's osteoporotic bone. What's happening is you have increased osteoclastic activity and decreased osteoblastic activity. Why is it important? Because we're breaking down more bone than we're building. So we want to be able to, we want to, be able to preserve that stuff. What type of people are more prone to this? Typically, small females. And if you think of it this way, first off they're small and second off they're females. So female, estrogen, okay, you get older, your estrogen level tapers off. Small is, if you remember, we said your bone remodels throughout your whole life. So if you're a tiny little thing and you don't weigh much, you're not putting a lot of pressure through your bones, so they don't feel the need to lay down and store all this calcium and have nice, thicker, rigid bones. So unless if you're small, you want to be doing high impact activities from a young age so you lay down a nice bone, bony network and you're protected from osteoporosis in older age. Okay, stuff that they do to treat uh, osteoporosis and prevent it. One of the things is increased calcium and vitamin D intake. Okay, if you have more calcium, your body has more stuff to lay down and it doesn't need to worry about breaking calcium out from your bones. Next thing is weight-bearing exercises. So you're doing high-impact activities, putting stress on the bone, so you're using it, so your body's going to want to reform it. Next one's going to be estrogen. So as we have increased estrogen levels, that helps protect the bone. And then we have some other drugs. We have some drugs like Fosamax, for example. What Fosamax does is that decreases osteoclastic activity. Sounds like a great idea because now you're not going to be breaking down your bones and you're going to be laying down new bone with osteoblasts. But, as we talked about before, your body's constantly remodeling bones. So if you're on this for many years, all of a sudden your bones aren't going to be remodeling and, and changing to meet your current needs. And what, they can, what can happen is they can become what's called brittle. And they can become more likely to break. Okay, we have something called osteomalacia. Osteomalacia is going to be when calcium salts aren't deposited properly. And with our rickets, sorry about that, with osteomal osteomalacia and rickets, you're not going to have proper use of calcium by your bones. All right, with rickets, usually the kids are going to have some sort of like bow-leggedness is the most common thing you'll see. The big thing that goes along with it is going to be some sort of vitamin D deficiency or calcium deficiency. We need vitamin, vitamin D helps us with the absorption of calcium. If we don't have vitamin D, we can't absorb calcium. And that's it. We're